Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 78, The Life of Griffith Ap Canaan, part 3. We talked heavily last time about how Griffith came to power. The new king, who had desperately tried to become king on three occasions, had finally succeeded. But the land he ruled was a shadow of the dominant kingdom of Llewellyn, or Cadwallon, or even Cadwaller for that matter. The kingdom of Gwyneth was a wreck. It had been mauled by, on at least two occasions in the past decade by the Normans. Much of the country was likely in the shape that saw Doithbarth turned into during the last years of its individual independence. And then eventually, of course, subsumed by the Normans into their holdings. So the question is, why did Gwyneth survive? And better yet, how did it become the last major dynasty in of Welsh kingdoms. You know, in 1099, there's no evidence that this was going to be the case. The country itself was pretty badly shaped. Some of the nobles had fought and or achieved a version of independence from the kingdom. There was a sense that it had fallen on hard times, that Powys was now the real leader, and that it had an unproven and unloved king from what we've seen. So how would it be able to recover? How could it actually do it in the shape of this last issue? You know, why did it survive? And how did Griffith become the founder of this last true dynasty of Wales? Well, in 1099, when Griffith settled into his new kingdom, it was largely consisted only of the island of Anglesey. This was the base from which Griffith had launched two previous attempts to take Gwyneth. So obviously this was a place of strength for him. It was a place that he had obviously built connections and had developed within it a sense of unity. As he was the king, they would follow. Yet at the same time, you were left with the question as to why he was only given this small land. Why was he shut out of the rest of Gwyneth? Professor Kerry Mond suggests that the reason for this came down to expediency. There was a lot of very independently minded nobles, as we mentioned, in Gwyneth at the time, and managing them would be difficult in and of itself. In fact, on two occasions, we've already talked about how Griffith had been betrayed by leaders in Gwyneth, so he may have felt it best to consolidate his power base before moving forward. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to show that he was very careful about things that he did after this, and making the right political moves were important to him, and being careful and being cautious mattered a whole lot more than being successful briefly and then failing mightily. The first order of business for any potential monarch is to make the right political move on who will be his queen. So realizing he needed to get one of his opponents on side, he married Owen Ap Edwin's daughter, Angherad. Remember, at this stage, Griffiths is, in his, is a middle-aged man. He's at least in his 40s and had obviously had a wife before, at least one, and had had children by her, as we'll talk about in a second. But nonetheless, he was obviously available enough to bring in uh, this girl to be his wife or this woman to be his wife. Unfortunately, we have no idea how old this lady is or kind of what the comparison is to this politically. One assumes that she was younger than he was, but there's no way to know for sure. Also, Owen was not just some rival. He was a thorn in Griffith's side for decades, likely responsible for costing Griffith the throne in the first place and causing him to end up in captivity. So to have him on side would be a big feather in his cap and would help him move forward. The next step was to marry his daughter, Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn to Cadogan, which would have created a rather useful alliance with the most powerful king in Wales at this point. For the next 15 years, basically from 1099 until 10 to 1114, it appears that Griffiths was in too weak a position to move from his power base in Anglesey. Basically, the only thing he really did was he grabbed Arfon, uh, which was south of Anglesey on the main part of Wales, and included the old Roman fort at Canarfan and the old seat of the Gwynish kings. Um, the symbolism, of course, must have been meaningful, if nothing else, but 
this area was close enough to his power base to allow him some protection. It would allow him the opportunity to spread out and, in the end, to take over the Llin Peninsula without too much trouble, one would hope. But there appears to have been a roadblock in the east as Owen's, Ap Edwin's son, Goronwi, appears to have been seen on the level of Griffith and in some ways was on the level of being an independent lord or possibly king. Uh, and that, along with the fact that he was probably still trying to get the Hlin Peninsula under control during that time period, probably hampered uh, Griffith's ability to take that part of Gwyneth over, which effectively meant he was shut out from the eastern side of Gwyneth and was only really able to consolidate the West End. By 1114, things had changed for Griffith. At least in some respects, he had gained an alliance with Powys, which was fairly important to him in his slow advance to power. Keeping the biggest Welsh kingdom on your side would, of course, be a help. But one of the drawbacks of that is when that same kingdom needed you in an ill-advised venture, you're kind of stuck. And unfortunately for him, he was in that position, and as was Goronwy, and when Powys and King Henry I, grandson of the Conqueror, came to blows. According to the Chronicle of the Princes, this was down to the son of Hugh of Chester's hatred of Gronwy and Griffiths, and his desire to exterminate the Britons in that fantastic language of the Chronicle, always about, you know, that the English or Normans or fill-in-the-blank whoever were always out to exterminate, you know, the Britons, much like the way Bede's language was about Cadwallon and Cadwallar and the idea that they were out to destroy and extinguish uh, the English or the Northumbrians. It's hyperbole, obviously. And so you, once you get past that, things change a little bit. Like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for example, describes the whole event as nothing more than a bit of a show of Norman force, led to a, which led to a quick peace, hardly the stuff of extermination. And it's times like these where you have to remember the biases involved and how they influence the writings of these documents. And so we can understand that, we can move from that. And of course, when one looks down deep at what the Chronicle writes, the um, Chronicle of the Princes, to be exact, uh, it stresses the idea that this was really... I mean, they, they trumpeted it up by saying that the Normans had called all the military from Scotland to Cornwall to come help them take on the Welsh and, and put down this Powys-led resistance. But yet there really wasn't much to it. They met, they agreed to a peace treaty peace treaty was a little onerous and that was all there was to it so if henry was really out for blood really out for extermination in quotes um certainly that would have been very apparent very quickly i would think and unlike the reality which was a lot tamer in fact Powys continued to be a bit of a thorn in the side for the english and there continued to be even up to 1121 henry would once again come into a near war with them and in this case it was with Meredith at Bledin uh, and Meredith came to Griffith looking for an alliance but at that point Griffiths had already worked through a peace with the Normans and seemed to be very disinterested in trying to fight the Normans I mean you have to look at it in the fact that at this stage Griffiths is basically in his 50s maybe 60s at this point he's an old man in an area probably leading a, a, a grumpy bunch of people and trying to be in charge of an ever-growing kingdom and i think the last thing he wanted was to get into a conflict with the normans which could cost him his kingdom once again i think the reality of it is his desire for war at a younger age became too difficult to try and continue at a much elderly age. And I think he was pretty much convinced after his time abroad that uh, it wasn't in his best interest to take on the Normans full stop. Of course, the life looks at this very differently. It, it examines this from the concept that Griffiths had been wronged by the Earl of Chester and that 
the Earl had gone to the King of England and demanded that he help him get back his property and his money and and effectively Henry spent a lot of time and effort to get back something that he didn't need to get back and thus the reason why he came to Griffith and fought with him and of course in the in the life there's no talk of the of the other kingdoms or their position in this situation or the fact that they were actually probably the majority partner in this like Powis and there was no mention of anybody who wasn't Griffith to be blunt the one thing that the peace treaties that uh, Griffiths had created with the Normans had done, though, is it gave him an opening to be able to take back the lands that the Gwyneth had indeed lost to Powys and lands that it had lost control of because of the lords who had sort of taken up an independent movement. And certainly Griffith's sons were a definitely a part of taking that back and certainly grabbing as much as they could away from the sons of Edwin. And they certainly went about on a very vigorous campaign all through the 1120s to do that. Which, of course, is fascinating because their mother being one of them, uh, the daughter of, of Owen, you would have thought there would have been some allegiance there, but her son ends up killing his uncles, uh, mostly because it was felt that they would betray them and that it was worth it to take them out. And so by 1125, Cadwallon up Griffith had actually made sure of these things and had taken care of his erstwhile uncles. By 1132, this ambition had grown so much that uh, Cadwallon made an enemy of one of his cousins, Cadugan ap Gornwy, and he was killed. This basically put an end to the expansion of Gwyneth into powis influenced lands and stop the eastward expansion back to their old land claims towards Chester in that area. So at that point, with Griffith still alive at this stage, he was still fighting to get back what Gwyneth had had in the past. But he was doing so on a very patient basis. So you could see that he was starting to take back control. At the same time, Powys is having conflicts with the King of England and struggling to be able to maintain their influence in the lands that they held. So they were vulnerable. And so this goes back to a point that was made at one stage, which is that Griffiths, far being this uh, stabilizing force in Welsh history or this person who was a, an example of someone who allied with Powys and with others to try and defeat the Normans, had in fact been used to stabilize the Powys forces and to try and make that kingdom a little lessened and basically to offer it a problem at its west while it's dealing with the English in the east. And certainly this makes some sense to me just based on what I've been able to see here because Griffiths, over his life, has continued to push his neighbors out of the old lands and he's continually trying to take back Gwyneth's power base and in doing so, of course, influence the rest of Wales. Well, of course, that division will keep up the problems that Wales has with the Normans because at the same time, while one side's fighting the other, it allows the Normans to enforce their foothold in the south and in the east and continue to create these borders with the marcher lords that are much more difficult for the Welsh to take back and will effectively set up the end game for Wales in the next century because there isn't a united force to deal with the enemy. And as the enemy continues to pick off more and more places, this will be continually a problem for them. So, as we get into the 1130s, and especially as we get towards the mid-1130s, uh, Griffiths reaches the end of his life, and he passes away at age 30, 80 years old. So he lived a heck of a long life, and partially because of that, he outlived most of his enemies. Even if he didn't kill them on the battlefield, most had passed away by the time he did. That gives him the ability to set up his dynasty the way he wanted it to be because his longevity 
allowed him to pass it to his sons, and most of his opposition was dead. And they kind of cleared the path for Gwyneth to fall to this dynasty. And so, in a way, that was an amazing achievement because his longevity allowed for this. Also, his tenacity in taking back Gwyneth and taking back his stronghold of power in Anglesey and in the end getting revenge for his father and his grandfather allowed him to take control of the old kingdom. By his death, they effectively control most of Gwyneth and by his death, Gwyneth will once again start to ascend at the expense of Powys. And we'll see more and more of this as we go forward and we start to talk about how things change over the next hundred years and how we go from a kingdom to the east controlling most of Wales to this old northern kingdom, the old Vonadini area, once again returning to being a major player in this discussion at the same time that its surrounding kingdoms are starting to dissipate or just cease to be kingdoms entirely. And of course, at the same time, the way that the English monarchy starts to deal with these kings will change quite dramatically. As we enter the Plantagenet era, we're going to see a very different way of looking at what have been the Welsh kings to being the Welsh princes and the principality of Wales as opposed to the kingdom of Wales. And how will that create the problems that will go forward and how those allegiances and the medieval ideas of liege lords and honoring them become an issue for the Welsh. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about this in detail, but we're going to go back a little bit. And we're going to talk about the uh, Welsh Crusades next time. I think that's a very fascinating idea to talk about how the Crusades influenced um, what our Welsh kings and the Welsh population would do especially with the perception that it was a Norman idea. So I think it's a really fascinating discussion to have, and I and, and I want to get into it in more detail. I know I promised to do this a couple weeks back. I didn't expect this particular discussion to last three episodes, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been great to have this much information to work from. Uh, it's fascinating to read these kind of ideas about these kings, and I think... To end off with, I'd just like to read you an excerpt from the life and kind of the way it looked at and presented the king. And it says, At his latter end there came to him the most important and wisest of all the kingdom, David, Bishop of Bangor, Simeon, the archdeacon, a man who was ripe in years and wisdom, the priory of the monastery of Chester, and many priests and clerics to anoint his body, he, of course, being Griffith, with consecrated oil in accordance with the command of the Apostle James. His sons were also amongst them, and he blessed them and told them what manner of men they should be in their future. Like Jacob and the patriarchs blessing their sons of old in Egypt, he enjoined upon them to be courageous and to oppose enemies stoutly, after his fashion in the latter days. Likewise, Queen Angharad, his wedded wife, was there, and to her he gave half of his goods, and two parts of land, and the harbor of Abermenai, and his daughters and a certain of his nephews were there, and to all of those he also gave a portion of his property to support them after his days. Welshmen, Irishmen, and Danes lamented the decease of King Griffith, like the mourning of the Jews for Joshua of Nun. Eighty-two years with Griffith when he died, and he was buried at Bangor in the vault at the left side of the great altar in the church. We pray that his soul may rest in the same manner, and that it is in God, together with the souls of other good kings, forever and ever. Amen. And I'd just like to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for sending your thoughts and your opinions and your contributions to this podcast. I really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, everyone, we'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. Hi. 
I'm Mark Machado, broadcaster and Sri Lankan cricket fan. Every week, Estelle Vazu, Devon and myself will drop several episodes of Sri Lanka on 99.94, keeping you up to date on the latest from the Sri Lankan cricketing world. If you want to know what Hasaranga is up to, where Chabri Athapattu scored her runs, or what Narosha Dickweller has been discussing behind the stumps, then make sure to watch or listen to Sri Lanka on 99.94. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube and on the 99.94 app. Join the Shrunken Crooked Conversation and get involved.